Professor Dulac, um, Professor Tupi, Rektor Schütze, um, dear Professor Tanaka, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Austrian Academy of Science, I would like you to um, welcome here to this eight Hans Tupi lecture with Catherine Dulac, uh, which is organized in cooperation with the University of Vienna. My name is Heinz Fassmann, and I'm the president of the Austrian Academy um, since 2022. I'm delighted that our festive hall was chosen uh, for this lecture. I think it's a beautiful hall, isn't it? Um, um, with a ceiling fresco um, showing the traditional four faculties of the university, theology, law, medicine, and philosophy. Um, there is only one problem with this ceiling fresco. Once you start looking at it, it's easy to get lost um, because there are so many figures um, and so many persons on it. And then you stop paying attention to the lecture. Um, so, so take care um, um, if you start it. One sentence in the direction of advertising um, for the ÖAW, the Academy, is Austria's largest non-university research and science institution um, with a mission, a mission given by law to promote science in every way, every way. Um, around 1,800 researchers, technicians, and administrative persons um, are employed. We have a three-year budget of around 450 million. I hope that the next three-year budget will be a little bit higher. Um, and uh, in, in addition to that, uh, we have 150 million euro getting from other funds, um, um, especially from the FAF or the Horizon Europe. The Academy of Science tries to fulfill the following three functions, or is based on three different pillars. One is it assembles uh, the most qualified national and international researchers in the Hall of Fame, Gelehrtengesellschaft, to discuss issues and to get advice. It awards scholarships and research funds in a very competitive way for all researchers in Austria. And uh, that's the third function and third pillar. It maintains 26 research institutes in Vienna, Graz, Innsbruck, Linz, Klagenfurt. Um, so we are an Austrian Academy of Science and not in Vienna. Academy of Science. And these institutes are specialized in different disciplines, and some of them are really world-class institutes. Um, quantum physics could be an example for this. I would furthermore especially like to welcome the name giver of this lecture, Hans Tupi, who is with us in the audience tonight. Um, Hans Tupi, he's a full member of the Austrian Academy of Science since 1967. He was president of the Austrian Academy of Science as well as president of the Austrian Research Funding Agency, as well as Minister for Science and Research, as well as rector of the university, and finally, um, as one of the most prominent Austrian biochemistry. Um, Thank you very much, Hans Tupi, for coming. And it's always a pleasure to meet you again. Um, you are a wonderful person. Um, if the three greeting words um, announced in the program, if the three greeting words are longer than the lecture, then something would go wrong. Therefore, I stop. I wish you an engaged lecture and, and hand over the greetings words to the rector of the University of Vienna, Sebastian Schütze. Thank you.
Ja, dear uh, President Fassmann, um, dear Professor Dulac, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, and of course, it's a very special um, um, moment for me to uh, also welcome Professor Tuppi here um, uh, to the, and all of you to the Hans Tuppi Lecture uh, 2023. Um, the lecture series has been founded jointly by the Austrian Academy and the University of Vienna to honor the extraordinary achievements of um, Hans Tuppi. And you have already heard uh, only a, a short list of all his, the offices he has filled. But he, uh, as uh, Heinz Fassmann already said, is especially a very, very important um, personality in the field of uh, bio chemistry. Um, Hans Tuppi has been, throughout his very long and distinguished career, always been attached to the University of Vienna, and that gives us a very special pride. He uh, studied at the University of Vienna, he got his PhD and his Habilitation at the University of Vienna, he uh, was professor of biochemistry at the University of Vienna, was dean of the Faculty of Medicine which uh, now, uh, of course, has been separated from the University of Vienna, but we are still very much uh, collaborating with the Medis Medical University, especially in the field that uh, uh, Professor Tuppi has dedicated all his life to, so that is um, molecular biology in uh, particular. And uh, so uh, we are very, very proud um, uh, about this uh, cooperation with the Academy uh, to hold this lecture every year. Uh, since its inception, um, the Tupi Lecture has brought uh, world-renowned specialists uh, to Vienna, working in biochemistry uh, and molecular biology in particular, including, and I'm just naming a few uh, famous names in the field, Adrian Peter Bird, Maria Leptin, Kurt Wüthrich, or Caroline Luga, reflecting, I think, in the first place, the high esteem in which um, Hans Topi is, is held in the field. And obviously the lecture is also a very good occasion to highlight every year the um, importance of Vienna uh, as a hub for research in this particular field. And I think it's fair to say that um, molecular biology, biochemistry, that's a field where uh, Vienna really is on the world map. And the two institutions that have co-founded the lecture, uh, I would say, contribute substantially to uh, the, the quality of that research in Vienna through a series of institutions. Today, we are celebrating already the eighth uh, Tupi lecture. And we are extremely uh, grateful to Professor Dulac uh, that she has uh, accepted our invitation. Uh, and she will now be presented by uh, Professor Eli Tanaka in terms of her uh, scientific research, of course, and, and all her contributions uh, to the field. So welcome again uh, to the lecture tonight. Catherine Dulac has performed pioneering work, oops, <laughs> has performed pioneering work in the perception of pheromones and the neural basis of behaviors. Dr. Dulac is currently the Samuel Morris of University Professor in the Department of Molecular Cell Biology at Harvard University and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. She performed her PhD work in the laboratory of the eminent Nicole Le Doirin, examining the environmental influences on Schwann cell differentiation. During her postdoctoral work in Richard Axel's lab, she implemented single cell uh, cDNA libraries to identify pheromone receptors in the olfactory uh, vomeronasal system. Now, single cell technologies are now commonplace, but Catherine implemented these methods in the 1990s. This very early implementation of single cell methods ins inspired people like me in our own very first attempts to understand health cell heterogeneity during regeneration. As I'm sure she will tell you today, she has gone on to study the molecular machinery and the neural circuits underlying sexually dimorphic social behaviors such as parenting. The use of pioneering technologies to address key scientific questions 
has characterized her career. And for this work, she has received many important awards, such as the Lounsbury Award, the Garrard Prize of the Society of Neuroscience, and the Breakthrough Award. She is a, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. We're truly honored that you, Catherine, are with us today to be uh, this year's Hans Tupi Lecture, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, all the very kind introduction. Um, I, I'm, I'm truly honored and delighted to give this year Hans Tupi lecture. Um, and uh, looking at um, the absolutely uh, extraordinary scientific life of Professor Tupi, uh, I, I really felt some connection by uh, his early interest in chemistry and biochemistry, which is actually my training uh, in biochemistry, and his later interest in neuroscience, uh, which uh, I, I think is just very emblematic of how the field of neuroscience has so many uh, unanswered questions and attracts um, minds that are interested in in uh, mechanistic e explanation, which uh, has been really the driving force um, uh, underlying the research in my lab. So uh, thank you so much uh, for all the kind introduction. Uh, thank you so much for um, the invitation. I also had a really terrific morning uh, this morning uh, to discussing with people at the uh, University of Vienna. So this was a really delightful visit. So. Um, uh, my lab has been interested over uh, many years in trying to understand the neural circuit that underlie social behaviors. And uh, why social behaviors? Well, um, it's... Now I can see you. <laughs> Social behavior, in, in my view, is one of the most interesting uh, behavior in, in animals and in human. Uh, we are social individuals. We like to be in group. We uh, enjoy each other. We sometimes hate each other. Certainly, um, thinking about the people we love, the people we hate, uh, the people around, you, around us, takes a lot of our brain time. Um, it's interesting to think that some of the most beautiful art, whether it's painting, sculpture, literature, is inspired by social interaction. And uh, in similar ways, for people who have pets, a dog, for example, there's nothing more interesting to a dog than another dog. And so, uh, Animals as a whole, human uh, in general, just uh, really need each other, enjoy each other, and I, I'll come back to that theme uh, a little bit later. What my lab is trying to do is really to use all sort of technology from very molecular, cellular, systems level modeling, uh, behavioral analysis, in try to understand how um, animals interact with each other, what are the specific circuitry, what what are the specific neuronal population? What are they? Can we identify them? How do they communicate with each other in order to uh, drive uh, various behaviors, particularly uh, interaction uh, between animals? And it turns out that um, about five years ago, my lab initiated two new, completely new projects, which is uh, what I will be telling about today. And it turns out that these two projects had uh, some, by coincidence, some really interesting um, relevance to uh, what happened a few years ago. Uh, one is uh, sickness behaviors, uh, which many of us have experienced uh, f um, relatively recently. And the other one is uh, loneliness. And so um, it turns out that uh, we were able to decipher the circuitry underlying sickness and underlying the sense of loneliness uh, in mice. And I hope this will be of interest to us. Actually, during the pandemic, I had absolutely no uh, involvement in, in anything medical or, or, or relevant. Uh, but I think that just the basic science underlying some of this function, I think, uh, is, is very interesting. 
So just as a general framework of our work, um, what uh, the, the type of approaches that we have in the lab is really to try to think brain-wide, uh, which is to try to understand what are the stimuli uh, that are used for, in, for animals to capture uh, signals in the environment, how these signals are in turn processed by specific brain circuitry, and um, in turn, according to the internal state of the animal, which could be uh, anything from uh, their gender, their sex, um, or their age, or uh, other uh, type of uh, behavioral state, then lead to a specific behavioral outcome. Now, this, you know, we work in mice, and there is something really important to consider um, as one consider various uh, animal system. One is that um, the type of sensory stimuli uh, that are important to various uh, species or various animals is extremely idiosyncratic, which is that every species really has uh, a set of signals that are relevant or salient to them. So for example, this uh, bird here, this American flicker, recognize individual uh, flickers being males or females solely based on the fact that they have this little patch of black fe feathers in males, but not in females. Mice, in turn, uh, will recognize males from females based on pheromonal cues, and humans, obviously, are way more complicated. Uh, but overall, I think this species specificity is really something very important to, um, to recognize, and in fact, it makes a lot of sense, because if you're a bird of a particular species, you want to interact with a bird of your own species. So the fact that these signals are so idiosyncratic is actually uh, extremely relevant to uh, the biology and the behavior of those species. By contrast, uh, it is thought that the central circuitry that trigger, that organizes these behaviors are largely conserved uh, throughout species. So uh, behaviors are indeed um, very, uh, look very similar across species. They are not identical, obviously. But it's very likely that the neural architecture underlying, let's say, parenting behavior in birds, in mice, or in human have something in common. So over my career, as uh, Ellie nicely summarized, I started by looking at sensory stimuli that trigger social behavior. And in mice, uh, many of these stimuli are detected by a particular set of chemosensory neurons uh, in this structure called the vomonasal organ uh, in the tip of the nose. And uh, these neurons project to a particular structure called the accessory olfactory bulb, and then to the medial amygdala, and then to hypothalamic centers that um, are uh, triggering aggressive behavior, mating behavior, and other type of social behaviors. And it's interesting to see that the system actually bypasses cortical areas of the brain and so lead to what are thought to be instinctive behaviors uh, in, in, in animals. And so we were able to identify the molecular makeup, the molecular signaling machinery driving um, the function of these neurons. And this led us to recognize how important the vomonasal organ is in providing sex specificity of behavior, mating, aggression, and other type of behaviors. From this, my lab then moved on into more central circuitry, and in particular, we were uh, interested by naturalistic paradigms, so natural behaviors that animals undergo, complex behavior, and the one we uh, got interested in in particular is parenting behavior. Um, and parenting and then its opposite behavior, which is that in many species, males actually attack infants, and so there is this um, balance or dual uh, circuitry driving parenting behavior in some circumstances and infanticidal behavior in other circumstances. And that, this led us to identify very dedicated neuronal population in the hypothalamus that drive parenting behavior and um, infanticidal behavior. And we're currently studying um, how these two circuitry uh, interact with each other and are regulated to drive one behavior or the other.
What we uh, came to realize is that the display of specific behavior really depends on the animal behavioral state, physiological state or other type of external states. And this led us to uh, got interested in two new type of behavior. One is sickness behavior, and I'll tell you why, and the other one is social isolation and the response to social isolation. And so I will start by uh, telling you our recent um, study on sickness behavior and in the second part of my talk on uh, how does the brain respond to social isolation and drives individuals to seek uh, uh, social encounters. So sickness, uh, we all know how awful it is to be sick and how much this affects a lot of um, our function, our emotions, our um, behavior in general. And interestingly, um, the types of uh, sickness, so-called sickness behaviors, such as um, uh, fever, uh, warm seeking, you know, going under the blanket, looking for hot tea or hot soup, uh, loss of appetite, lethargy, uh, social avoidance, you know, leave me alone, uh, increased pain, sens pain sensitivity, etc. This uh, list of uh, sickness behaviors are extraordinary conserve, which is we experience these symptoms, uh, rodents uh, experience the same symptoms, birds as well, and even cold-blooded animals. So this was tested in reptiles, oops, uh, in reptiles, um, in um, uh, uh, um, grasshopper and in honeybees, uh, they also experience uh, very similar symptoms. Now, obviously, um, they cannot regulate their uh, body temperature uh, because they are cold-blooded animals. And so instead of raising their body temperature internally, they actually go to a warm place uh, for their uh, body temperature to go up. So um, we instinctively think of these sickness behaviors as us being, you know, um, uh, experiencing the toxic effect of the pathogens or maybe the side effect of the immune system going to overdrive. But uh, it turns out that the idea that uh, all these symptoms are very highly conserved led to a, a really interesting concept that maybe actually uh, these are not side effect of the pathogen or the immune system, but that they could be adaptive uh, uh, behavioral changes. And so why is that? Well, for some of them, it's pretty uh, intuitive, which is that when body temperature goes up, then uh, the germ have more difficulty to, um, to uh, multiply, to, to grow, and it gives a boost to the immune system. Uh, lethargy is a way to uh, um, save energy to fight the pathogen. Uh, social avoidance is a way to avoid that uh, the uh, pathogen spreads. Some are a little less intuitive for example, loss of appetite. But actually, uh, it seems, uh, experiments uh, have shown that if you gavage a mouse that is sick, you actually reduce dramatically the survival of, of, of the mice. So again, the idea is that all of these are uh, evolutionary conserved symptoms for the animal to better survive um, the uh, infection. And so what is orchestrating then all those behaviors? Well, uh, work by Cliff Sapers and, and others have shown that actually the brain is essential in organizing the symptoms. And what's happening is that during a peripheral uh, infection, pathogens uh, trigger uh, the peripheral immune system. This in turn leads to uh, particular uh, inflammatory agents, chemokines, cytokine, to cross the broad brain barrier, particularly in area uh, that are f in which the blood brain barrier is fenestrated, means they are opening. And this lead then to uh, the local activation of uh, neuronal and non-neuronal cells, and in turn lead to fever and, and the other symptoms. So in the case of body temperature, uh, Cliff Saper actually showed that uh, a peripheral infection leads 
leads to um, uh, the generation of prostaglandin, the prostaglandin in turn inhibit a particular set of neurons that is warm sensing. These are the neurons when you go to a warmer place, feel that the temperature is going up too much and therefore will do whatever it takes to stop thermogenesis and initiate thermolysis in order to temperature to go down. Now, if these neurons are not inhibited, fever cannot be triggered. So this is an essential uh, pathway for uh, the um, body to be able to raise its temperature in inflammatory circumstances such as fever. So what we were interested in is how are not only fever, but the other symptoms of sickness controlled uh, at the cellular and circuit level. And so the first step was to uh, develop a paradigm to look at sickness. And for this, we didn't use actual pathogens. We use uh, LPS or poly-IC um, that mimic uh, for LPS a bacterial infection and for poly-IC a viral infection. And when we inject this into a mouse, what we see is after a couple of hours, the body temperature goes up. Now, importantly, uh, one has to dose those substances very carefully carefully, because if you put too much, then instead of having a raise of temperature, a fever, you actually have a decrease of temperature because you have a septic shock. And um, in addition to this raise in temperature, uh, we were able to look at other symptoms of sickness. So for example, we put the mouse into uh, this temperature gradient, and we look at, at what is the preferred temperature of the mouse. So if the mouse is sick, it will go to a warmer place. We also look at food consumption, where to see whether the animal has lost uh, appetite or not, and then we look at locomotion. And what we found is after both LPS and poly-IC um, injection, uh, the animal uh, go, goes to a higher temperature as its preferred temperature, loses appetite, and reduces locomotion. So overall, uh, this uh, injection really reliably trigger uh, a number of sickness symptoms. Um, so the second step was to try to identify which neurons in the brain are activated uh, during um, this uh, inflammatory challenge. And we were particularly interested in this area here at the bottom of the brain in the hypothalamus that lines the broad brain barrier. And what we found is that indeed um, there is a subset of neurons that uh, are activated. And, and to look at neuronal activation, we use a molecular readout of um, uh, neuronal activation, which is the expression of the immediate early gene FOS. And as you can see, compared to saline injection, here we have these cells that are labeled in black here because they express this immediate early gene CFOS after LPS injection. And um, these neurons are inhibitory, and, then, and you'll see why this is important to mention. I also should mention that uh, a few months later after our uh, publication, another group, the one of Jeff Friedman, uh, published a very different result, uh, but this time using much higher concentration of uh, LPS that this time tri trigger hypothermia, which we think is a sign of septic shock. So it's a slightly different uh, type of illness than the one we're looking at. So what are these neurons doing? They are activated, but do they have any role in the sickness behavior itself? And so for these, we use a genetic trick, uh, which is we use the promoter of the FOS gene driving a quid recombinase, which enables them to express either um, a reporter, such as detomator or an actuator, um, uh, under the control of uh, this uh, CFOS CRE that recombine this uh, stop here, and in the presence of tamoxifen uh, that makes the cre recombinase uh, go to the nucleus, uh, then uh, the activated cell express either the tomato and the actuator, which is what you see here. Uh, you can see uh, the uh, expression here of the D tomato by the cells that have been uh, activated. 
And so why is this important? Well, now we can actually express what are called actuator, meaning genes that enable, molecules that enable to either activate those cells or inhibit or kill uh, the activated cells. So uh, the paradigm is the following. Uh, we uh, trap, we use this system here after injection of LPS. So uh, the activated neurons now express the query recombinase, and these enable us to express either um, uh, a receptor that can be activating the neurons or uh, a system that kill the neurons that have been activated. And so what do we see? Uh, when we activate uh, uh, the, when we act artificially activate um, uh, the, uh, um, L, uh, the uh, neurons in this structure called VMPO, we found an increase in body temperature. When we kill these uh, VMPO neurons that have been uh, trapped, then we see that there's no longer any fever. So that suggests that these VMPO LPS neurons, so these neurons uh, that are susceptible to LPS um, activation, are essential for generating a fever. Are they important for the other symptoms of sickness? Um, for these, we uh, activate these VMPO LPS neurons, and we found that the mouse goes to a higher temperature in the gradient, loses appetite, and doesn't change its locomotion. When we kill these neurons and now inject LPS to the mouse, we found that uh, uh, animals are no longer uh, looking for higher temperature. Uh, they still lose appetite and they still reduce their locomotion. So what that suggests is that these VMPO LPS neurons located here are required for worm seeking. They participate in loss of appetite, but they have no role in the reduction of locomotion. So how do they fulfill their function? And for these, the idea is to look at the projection of these neurons to the brain, identify the target areas, and try to see what are these different target areas doing. So the um, projections, which we can identify using uh, viral tools, uh, are very interesting. They are 12 or 15 of them, and there are only two of these targets that uh, we looked in detail. Uh, one is the so-called MNPO, also an area of the hypothalamus that is important for uh, temperature uh, sensing. These are the area that contain these warm sensing neurons that I mentioned in the introduction. And the other one is the arcuate nucleus, which is really important because it controls appetite. And what we found is that um, the neurons that are activated in this structure is for the MNPO, the warm sensing neurons, and we recognize this because these neurons express exactly the right marker. And uh, in the arcuate nucleus, oops, um, these are neurons expressing AGRP, which are the neurons that are known to control appetite. And when we look at the connectivity of these cells, and uh, when we activate specifically the target of VMPO neurons to the MNPO, we found that it, re it leads to an increase in body temperature, but had no effect on appetite. By contrast, when we um, uh, activate the projection to the arcuate nucleus, we see a decrease in appetite, but no change in body temperature. So we think that um, only these two, oops, these uh, two uh, pathway uh, are sufficient to control um, the um, temperature and the appetite from these sickness neurons. We also identify some indirect connectivity, and I won't have time to really um, go into the detail of those, but those also are relate to area involved in control of temperature and appetite. So if you wish, there is a, a double safety system. They are both direct uh, connectivity that uh, decreases appetite, and there is indirect connectivity uh, that also um, add to, uh, to this control of appetite. 
And so the model we have, therefore, is that these VMPO LPS neurons, these neurons activated by uh, inflammatory challenge, are uh, connected to areas related to temperature, fever, warm seeking, as well as appetite suppression, both by direct as well as indirect pathways. And so the question that remains is, what is the identity of these cells? Can, can we identify them molecularly or genetically? And second, uh, how are they activated? Are they activated by uh, other um, neural pathway? Are they activated by cytokine or other uh, chemical agents? So in terms of uh, cellular identity, we use uh, single cell strategies. Uh, we perform single cell sequencing, so look at the transcriptome of individual neurons in this area after the animal had been injected with LPS. And what we find is that there are uh, some subpopulation, exactly actually two of them, that express CFOS. One is a neuronal population, that's this one, and another one is a non neuronal population. When we then use a second approach, which is an in situ transcriptomic approach called MURFISH, we recognize that the neuronal population we had identified is located here. Uh, it's this blue population here. And uh, what you have here is the bottom of the brain, where the broad brain barrier is. And so this population is really perfectly well uh, positioned uh, to receive signals that cross the broadband barrier. Moreover, when we look at the particular population, um, subpopulation that is activated uh, during sickness, uh, the cells that are here in purple, you can see um, that they are the ones that are absolutely adjacent and lining the broadband barrier, suggesting that there's something really interesting happening here, some signal likely comes um, from the broad brain barrier or, or local signal. We found also ependymal cells and astrocytes also located uh, along the broad brain barrier or along the ventricle. And so uh, this suggested that there are specific cell populations that are activated by LPS. We actually know, can recognize that population based on gene expression. Um, we also uh, made this uh, interesting observation that the cells are near the um, blood brain barrier or the ventricle. And so the idea is that maybe there are some paracrine mechanisms that lead to the activation of these neurons. And so the question is, well, this is all good as a hypothesis, but are there actually chemokines, cytokines that are produced locally? And more importantly, are these uh, VMPO LPS neurons expressing the right receptor? And indeed, uh, when we looked after LPS injection, we find that there is prostaglandin synthase that is expressed along broad ve blood vessel, here shown in green, uh, interleukin uh, one beta expressed along the broad brain barrier and along the ventricle, and this chemokine called CCL2 also expressed along the ventricle. So they are chemokines, cytokines, and other uh, uh, prostaglandin synthase uh, enzyme that are induced uh, during LPS injection. So what about uh, the neurons themselves? Well, if we look at uh, EP2, which is a prostaglandin receptor, an interleukin-1 uh, receptor associated protein, or the receptor for this chemokine, we find that all these receptors are indeed expressed by the CFOS expressing neurons after, uh, during an inflammatory challenge. So the neurons express uh, the right receptor and the corresponding ligand are uh, induced uh, during a, 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 a sickness episode. So we have the chemokine, we have the neurons that express the right receptor, but how does it work? And for this, we went into doing some slice physiology, which is we make sections of the right place of the brain, and we recall uh, from uh, these um, VMPO LPS neurons and challenge them by putting prostaglandin, chemokine, interleukin, and see what is the effect on neuronal activity. And what we found is a 
dual effect uh, on the neurons themselves by increasing their intrinsic excitability as well as to their synaptic contact that increase the extrinsic excitability. So increase the excitatory input and decrease inhibitory input. So in other words, indeed, chemokine, prostaglandin, cytokine are able to increase the excitability of these cells, both uh, cell intrinsically as well as uh, activating uh, the synapses also uh, that go into them. We also find that there are some indirect effects uh, in which that interleukin actually lead to the increase of local synthesis of prostaglandin. So as a, um, as a final model, we then have this peripheral activation uh, uh, um, due to a pathogen uh, of the immune system that then lead to this really interesting uh, amplification of, of the inflammatory uh, signal through chemokine prostaglandin in, uh, interleukin that uh, then lead to the uh, excitation of the cells both intrinsically and through excitation of incoming synapses. And this in turn, uh, these neurons, these VMPO-LPS neurons, uh, projecting to specific areas of the brain lead to um, the fever, the worm seeking, and uh, the appetite suppression. So overall, what I showed you here is this really interesting molecularly identified neuronal population that lead to multiple symptoms uh, of sickness. Now, these neurons project to many different areas that the one I described to you, so there are probably way more to discover um, in, in the future. And a postdoc who did the work, uh, Jessica Osterhout, now has her own lab at the University of Utah, and uh, this is something that she's working on. Now, it's also important to consider that this is only one pathway of sickness, and there are likely many other ones in the brain. So, for example, I mentioned to you that uh, 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 Jeff Friedman identify other set of neurons that were activated during LPS challenge, this time by higher level of challenge of uh, LPS uh, concentration, therefore leading to a slightly different type of uh, inflammatory challenge than the one uh, we described. And similarly, Steve Lieber's lab, Steve Lieberless lab uh, identify also this other pathway of sickness uh, that uh, connect actually the, the lung uh, to the brain uh, through uh, the vagal nerve. So many uh, pathways of sickness. So uh, now let me turn to uh, the second part of the talk, which is loneliness, uh, social isolation. And um, to explain why I think this is a really fascinating um, question, uh, let me start by a quote which I think illustrates quite well what the scientific question is. And this is a quote from Charles Bukowski, who is an American author, that says, being alone never felt right. Sometimes it felt good, but it never felt right. And this is also illustrated in these two paintings that uh, I think depict very well two things, the joy of being together and the sadness of being alone. Now, why is that? Well, there's a very trivial explanation. You're happy to be with your friends because when you grew up, you know that being with your friends means you're gonna have good conversation, good food, maybe good drink, you're gonna have fun, and therefore, you're happy to be in group. And by contrast, if you're alone, it's boring, therefore, it's you know, not attractive. So that's one explanation. But there's probably something more than this, and that is that um, both in human and in animals, it's actually good to be together. It's good for reproduction, for predator defense, for thermoregulation, to initiate collaboration, whether it's foraging, finding food, parenting, all sort of collective uh, action. And by contrast, it's not good to be alone, and this has been recognized uh, both in humans as well as in animals. Long-term isolation lead to increased stress, fragmented sleep, uh, weakened immune system, increase in cardiovascular risk, 
increase in, cancer, in risk for cancer, impaired cognition, and amazingly, the symptoms are very similar in humans that are isolated, as well as a rat or pigeon or all sort of animals that are isolated, have very, very similar uh, type of manifestation of uh, social isolation. And so the conclusion to this is that maybe being together is actually a fundamental evolu evolutionary conserve need, which is we have to be together. It's not good to be isolated for a long period of time, and that perhaps the brain is responding to social isolation by telling the organism, hey, this is not good. Look for your conspecific. So there has been, uh, over the last uh, recent years, some initial studies of the circuit basis of social isolation, in particular the group of Ketai looked at mid-brain structure that provide reward when animals are together, and David Anderson, another group that looked this time at chronic social isolation and showed that some peptides play a huge role in increasing uh, all the symptoms of chronic social isolation. But the approach that we took was very different. Uh, we uh, start by some uh, very early observation of what's happening when an animal is isolated. And that is the following that were uh, described by uh, Panksepp and collaborators already in the 80s. If you take a group of rats or a group of mice that are together, and then you take one of them and you put them in isolation, for one day, two days, three days, few days, and then you put it back with one of the cage mates. There's something really interesting happening, which is that the animal start to interact with each other extensively. Um, and so what you see here after zero days of isolation, one day, three days, five days, each of these blue tick here is one event of social interaction. And as you can see, the longer the animal is isolated, the more intense their social interactions are. And this is a sign this is a rebound uh, that is uh, due to the isolation. And this rebound is actually a sign of a fundamental homeostatic need. What are homeostatic needs? Well, we need to drink, we need to eat, we need to sleep. And if you're food deprived, water deprived, or sleep deprived, there is a need state that is created, which is you feel thirsty, you feel hungry, you feel tired. And this this, in turn, will make you go to bed, drink water, eat food. So somewhere in the brain, there's something that tells the animal, hey, this is time for you to drink, to eat, or to sleep. Now, interestingly, if uh, the individual does not have access to water, to food, or, or to a bed, um, then um, there is the need state become uh, elevated, and as a, as a result, will be generate this rebound behavior, which is you drink more, you eat more, you sleep more. So the more sleep deprived you are, the more you sleep, the more food deprived you are, the more you eat, etc. And so the idea is the following, is that you have uh, this increased drive to eat, to drink, to sleep, and once you sleep, then that drive goes down. So that's the idea of a homeostatic need. There's a set point, if you wish, a bean counter of what you drink, what you eat, what you, how much you sleep, that tells you you need to uh, go eat, drink, or sleep. And so similarly, the rebound that we observe in, in social interaction after isolation tell us that maybe there is also similarly a drive for social interaction, somewhere in the brain, a bean counter of social interaction. Now, interestingly, some neurons have been identified that are, for example, responsible for the need to eat or food society, uh, these AGRP neurons or POMC neurons, and these neurons are all located in the hypothalamus. The neurons that control sleep drive, uh, food drive, uh, thirst drive are all located in the hypothalamus, and so similarly, we hypothesize that maybe there is a bean counter of social interaction in the hypothalamus, and that's uh, what we are looking for. The neurons that detect social isolation, the neurons that then provide social society. So how do we go for it? Well, 
the first thing that uh, my postdoc, Ding Lu, did was to take mouse lab, the lab strain called C57, and then do this uh, social isolation assay, just to confirm that indeed, the more you isolate the animal and the more there's this rebound uh, in social interaction. But then he got curious about other mouse strains, and so he tested two other strains, DBA2 and Bob C, and realized that those actually have way less social rebound than C57. And he thought, well, maybe they are strains that have an even higher rebound. And indeed, he found these different strains here, uh, C3H, uh, SWR, and even further, this FVB strain that have this extremely, extremely robust social sensitivity and this uh, very notable uh, social rebound. And so in the study I will tell you about, uh, we looked mainly at uh, FVB mice and compared them to C57 mice. Now, we mainly use female mice for a very simple reason, which is that adult males, when they are put together, will fight, and when they are put with a female, will mate. So they have a competing social drives, such as mating in aggression, and that's why we look at uh, adult females, because all we want to look at is really this social sensitivity, this social drive. Now, we were able to show that the in social interaction is specific. There's no particular attraction to an object by an isolated animal. We also see that there is no effect of the estrus cycle in females. We also, uh, when testing animals for two stress assays, elevated plus maize and open field, we see that with few days of isolation, the animals are not stressed. However, they have physiological changes, which can be recognized by the fact that they lose weight, for example. So this is uh, um, an example video of this mouse that has been isolated for a few days. These are the ultrasound vocalization. And as soon as we put conspecific, we see uh, all sort of uh, new behavior uh, emerging uh, here. Uh, these mice really interact with each other very, very closely. The isolated mouse follows the other one. Hey, hey, I need you, I need you. And uh, emitting all these really robust ultrasound that are actually quite rare uh, to observe uh, in mice, in, in females in particular. So, can we find this nuance? You know, our hypothesis makes a lot of sense that the hypothalamus has this bean counter of social interaction, but is that true? And so the first experiment that uh, we decide to do is to image neuronal activity in a wake behaving animal. And we do this using this um, miniscope, um, such that we have this green lens here, that goes to the bottom of the brain to this area called the medial preoptic nucleus where all the social uh, control um, are located. And, and we look at animals and, and neuronal activity in this area. And when we looked at FVB females, uh, we have these animals that are isolated for a few days, then at time zero here we bring them together, and then in uh, um, uh, yellow uh, shows uh, uh, high neural activity and blue low uh, neural activity or even inhibition. And as you can see, there are these interesting uh, dynamic occurring. There are neurons that are absolutely not active when animals are isolated and then are transiently activated when animals are reunited after isolation. There are neurons that have absolutely no, you know, they don't care of the social isolation. And there are neurons that are activated when animals are isolated isolated and then are, are inhibited afterwards. And, and these are uh, the numbers of those. And so that really uh, totally correspond to our hypothesis of neurons uh, encoding social isolation and then suddenly being uh, inhibited when animals are reunited and another population of neurons that are transiently activated when animals are reunited, likely encoding a social society. When we look at C57 black six, so the strain that is less sensitive, we find more or less the same dynamics, but probably fewer neurons that are involved. And so these are the dynamic that we see uh, that is now normalized. So neurons that we think are the putative reunion neurons that are silent during isolation and then transiently activate during reunion, and then the putative uh, isolation neurons that are active when animals are isolated and then have their activity repressed when animals are together. And 
And interestingly, when we look at the, when, where the nuances are in the field of view, as you can see, the nuances are really intermingled with each other. So it's, there are two populations in one particular place. So what are these nuances and what they do? Um, so uh, we use a similar uh, strategy as the one I described to identify the uh, uh, sickness nuance, which is the idea is, you know, maybe there are nuances that encode the state of isolation, nuances that encode reunion and social society that correspond to the function identified for hunger. For example, AGRP nuances drive hunger, POMC nuances drive society. Maybe this is the equivalent for social hunger, social society, as for food hunger and food society. And so, indeed, this is the case using CFOS as a readout of neuronal activity when animals are isolated. We found this population of neurons that are specifically activated during social isolation. And we found another population that is specifically activated when animals are reunited after social isolation. And because we have performed an atlas of cell type in this brain area, we can uh, readily identify that particular neuronal population as neurons expressing VIGLU2, this means these are excitatory neurons, and express this particular marker called MC4R. And the neurons that uh, are activated during reunion uh, are VGAT positive, meaning they are inhibitory neurons, and they express the marker TRHRH. So now we have a, a genetic handle to uh, try to identify the function of this neuronal population. And so what do we find? Well, first, uh, when we look at um, uh, neurons that are marked by MC4R, we found that they indeed correspond to neurons that are active during isolation and are inhibited afterwards. So that uh, is a good control. And we find that uh, indeed they are inhibited during reunion, activate during isolation. Um, they are not active when animals are socially housed. They are not uh, stimulated by stress, and they are not stimulated by eating. So there's something very specific about the activity of these neurons associated with social need. Can we demonstrate that they indeed encode social need in the brain? And for this, we use um, you know, the modern approach in um, circuit neuroscience, which is to artificially activate uh, um, these isolation neurons. And what we find is that when we activate these neurons, animals that have been group housed suddenly start to interact very intensely. So generating a rebound, an artificial rebound, just by virtue of uh, activate these uh, isolation neurons. Now, interestingly, we found that we can even activate the neurons when the mouse is alone and bring it back then to another conspecific, and we have the same increase in social interaction. This is interesting because it suggests that it's not simply that the activation drive social interaction uh, as a very acute effect, it actually generates a state that can be lasting up to now the animal uh, being in presence of another one. When we inhibit the activity of these cells, we found that animals no longer have a rebound. And uh, when we stimulate uh, these isolation neurons, when animal in, in one half of the cage, then the mice carefully avoid uh, that space, suggesting uh, that this stimulation is aversive. So what we found here is that uh, these neurons, um, um, when they are active, increase social need and convey negative valence. When we now manipulate the other population of neurons, the one that are activated during reunion, we find that if we activate them in a, um, a mouse that has been isolated, then we reduce the rebound, suggesting that indeed the activity of these neurons provides some type of social society. And in contrast to the previous population, when we activate the neurons, when the animal is in one half of the cage, the mouse seems to like it. It will much prefer that side of the cage than the other, suggesting that this time these neurons convey positive valence. In other words, it's bad to be alone, it's good to be together. 
Now, we also made what I think is a very important uh, observation, which is that these two neurons, these two neuronal populations, the isolation neurons and the reunion neurons, are actually directly connected with each other. Now, remember, one of the population is inhibitory. These uh, reunion neurons are inhibitory, and they directly synapse into the isolation neurons. Now, this is very interesting because it gives us some type of scenario of what could be happening when animals are together or alone. The idea is that when animals are together, these somehow activate the reunion neurons. These neurons are inhibitory, and they therefore uh, inhibit the isolation neurons. So the animal is happy, together with others, everything is fine. Now, if the animal is isolated, these reunion neurons are no longer activated. Therefore, the isolation neurons are no longer inhibited. They now start to fire and therefore drive uh, this aversive state and, and the social need. So, can we demonstrate this functionally? What are the downstream secrets of, of these cells? And so, we found that the uh, isolation neurons uh, send projection to multiple brain areas, and there are only three that I will be telling you about. Uh, there is a third one that I will briefly mention in the next slide, but I think the, those three are really the most interesting. One is to a structure called the paraventricular nucleus. This is a very interesting structure because this is where oxytocin, the so-called social peptide, is being made. And indeed, uh, the neurons that are activated during social isolation in that area express oxytocin. And if we inject animal an oxytocin receptor antagonist, when animals are isolated, then we reduce the social rebound. And so the idea is that when animals are alone, the social isolation neurons fire, they drive the release of oxytocin, and this oxytocin that is released in the isolated animal drives this so social need, increase the social need. We also found projection to an area that I had mentioned earlier, which is the arcuate nucleus. This is an area that controls appetite, and when we look at where are the projections, they actually are to the pumps in neurons, the neurons that drive social society. And indeed, when we activate specifically that projection, we found a reduction in appetite, no change in the um, a place avoidance, and no change in social interaction. So the idea is that by virtue of projecting, synapsing into POMC neurons, these isolation neurons are able to uh, reduce the appetite of the isolated animal. And then finally, we found that these neurons also project to uh, the lateral abenula. Now, lateral abenula is an interesting structure because it provides negative valence to behavior. And indeed, uh, when we stimulate the terminal of these isolation neurons to the lateral abenula, we found that it had no effect on food intake, but it increases the avoidance to that chamber and had no effect on social interaction. So the the idea is that um, the social isolation neurons, by virtue of its specific projection to oxytocinergic neurons, neurons uh, driving society and driving avoidance, conveys all the major effect of social isolation. There's another aspect that is quite interesting that I will briefly mention, which is the uh, um, relationship with the reward system. These neurons project to the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens, the ventral tegmental area, are the areas that control um, the um, release and, and the reception of dopamine, dopamine being um, a neurotransmitter that is extremely important in reward and motivation. And, you know, the slide is a little bit complicated, but basically the reunion neurons project to the VTA, the isolation neurons receive input from the nucleus accumbens that itself receive input from the VTA. And so our model is that during social interaction, 
uh, the reunion neurons are activated. These lead to the release of dopamine into the nucleus accumbens. Neurons in the nucleus accumbens are typically inhibitory, and therefore it inhibits the isolation neurons. So if you wish, this is another inhibitory loop between reunion and isolation. And indeed, uh, by looking at release of dopamine using specific sensors for dopamine, we find that after social isolation and right during reunion, there's release of dopamine. So this is rewarding. The animal likes to be together, doesn't like to be alone. So in the last few bits uh, of my talk, I will now deal with a question which I, I found personally really interesting, which is how do animals know they are together all along? Do they smell each other? Do they see each other? Do they hear each other? Do they touch each other? How do they know? And so when we isolate an animal, you know, they are deprived of all sensory input from other mice. So we decided that maybe we should test uh, several modalities um, at once. And so instead of having them completely isolated, we put them in the cage uh, separated by a divider that has holes in there. So they can see each other, they can smell each other, they can hear each other. And when we have that, they still are socially deprived and have a social rebound, suggesting that it's neither seeing, neither hearing, neither smelling. There's something else. Now, there are two sensory modalities that require touch. One is pheromone detection. In, in vertebrates, uh, pheromone detection is through contact, and the other one is touch. We could eliminate pheromone detection because we have a mutant for pheromone detection, and the rebound is not affected at all. So maybe it's touch. Um, and what type of touch? Well, touch is complicated. Uh, there are multiple neuronal populations. So first, uh, we injected animals with this compound called isogrivacin, which is an agonist of the GABA-A receptor, but it acts only peripherally, which is, you know, we can inject this into the mouse. It doesn't go into the brain. It just affects the sensory terminals outside. And when we do this, we increase the rebound in the animal treated with agrivacin, suggesting that when animals have, um, have their sensory, their, their, their peripheral uh, touch neurons inhibited, they need more interaction, more touch, in order to achieve social society. Now, there are multiple types of DRG neurons, and genetically we were able to separate those various types by using different uh, uh, mouse line in which either the small population called MRGB4 was uh, uh, killed or a larger population here of these uh, neurons expressing the marker NAV 1.8. So we use a Cree line, either MRGB4 or NAV 1.8, cross to a reporter mouse that express DTA, so a diphtheria toxin, to kill those cells and then test them and find that indeed in those circumstances the animals are very impaired in their social rebound. And so this suggests that indeed comfort touch plays a key role in the regulation of social need. And so, you know, these experiments are in mice, but I found it quite interesting that in human, at least, you know, we need touch, we like touch, we hug each other, we kiss each other. Sometimes, actually, we don't, we cannot touch each other, you know, we cannot touch a royal uh, person or, you know, there are all these social rules that are around uh, social touch. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I think it's a really uh, an interesting idea. So it has been shown many years ago uh, that uh, monkeys, for example, will prefer what is called a closed mother than a wire mother. The closed mother has just this soft fabric and, and the young monkey will go to that you know, comfort touch uh, mother rather than the wire mother that has just metallic structure and brings water and food. So the animal will prefer comfort touch than food and drink. And my postdoc, Ding, who is very ingenious, told me, hey, I created this, the equivalent of the hollow experiment, but for mice. And what he meant by this is this. 
to generate this little tunnel here that are lined with this soft fabric in which you know, the mouse could just have this comfort touch uh, by just virtue of, of, of being inside the tunnel compared to this plastic tunnel. And what he found is that when animals are together, if you ask them, what do they prefer? the plastic or the closed tunnel, there's absolutely no preference. You know, the average is 50%. But if you look at mice that have been isolated, there's a clear preference for the closed tunnel. So somehow they go to the, the soft comfort touch uh, rather than the other. Similarly, if you isolate a mouse and you put in the isolated cage either the closed tunnel or the plastic tunnel, you find that after uh, when animals are reunited, the one that were together with the closed tunnel have a lower rebound, suggesting that somehow their social need has been partially satiated by the closed tunnel. How is that the case? Well, indeed, now um, we, we have this even more uh, fluffy tunnel, as you can see, and it has a little hole on the top such that we can have the mouse with the little microscope on top of its head that crosses the tunnel so we can record neuronal activity of the isolation neurons and reunion neurons as the animal is crossing the tunnel. And what we found is that after animals are isolated and then reunited, uh, when we are in this situation here, we see some neurons that are activated, these are the reunion neurons, and some neurons that are inhibited, these are the isolation neurons. So based on that last phase here, we can tell which of the neurons are the reunion neurons, which one are the isolation neurons. And so when we now look at those neuronal populations when the animal is crossing the tunnel, you can see that indeed, each time the mouse is crossing the soft tunnel, then the reunion neurons are activated, suggesting that indeed, um, the soft touch is able to provide some type of social society um, and, um, and, and, and confirming uh, this role of this, the comfort touch. So to summarize, we found these two fascinating population that encode social society and social need. We have molecular and genetic markers for them. They are, mu uh, they are mutually connected. And we think that when animals are together, touch conveys the presence of a conspecific, therefore excite uh, and provide social, social society. And when animals are um, uh, alone, uh, now the social needs neurons are activated and lead to social seeking, negative valence, and physiological changes by virtue of the projection of this particular population. And by contrast, social society convey a whole different opposite range of um, uh, behaviors, reward, and social society by virtue of a completely different range of, um, uh, of, of uh, activation in downstream uh, target areas. So, you know, I show you to start with how these different mouse trains had very different sensitivity uh, to uh, social isolation. And you know, similarly, during the pandemic, some people were very happy to be together. Some people were very desperate. Uh, some people were very um, happy to be alone. And some people were very desperate to be alone. So there's a lot of heterogeneity. And similarly, we are just very interested to try to understand where are these differences in behavior between mouse train coming from? Is this because these neurons express different genes, maybe ion channel that provide different sensitivity, maybe different types of connectivity? This is something we're very interested in. And so overall, I mentioned the circuitry for uh, social isolation. I mentioned the earlier circuitry underlying sickness. In earlier work, uh, we also look at neurons that drive parenting behavior. In all these cases, we were able to identify molecularly defined population of neurons in the hypothalamus that drive this instinctive behavior that are modulated by uh, experience and, and the environment. And I think this uh, 
approach of identifying molecularly and manipulating these behaviorally relevant population is really important because it gives us access to causality in neuroscience. What are the molecular biophysical cell type mechanisms that leads to the control of specific behavior? And this is particularly important because it would enable us then to address the famous four questions um, that were uh, asked about functional evolutionary mechanistic and developmental insight of uh, behavior control, both in health and diseases. And um, I, will, uh, I would like to thank the people who did the work. The sickness secretary was driven by Jessica Osterhout, now at the University of Utah, and held by uh, collaborators in the lab. Social homeostasis was um, organized by Ding Lu, who, by the way, is on the job market. Uh, I think you should try to hire him. He's really an extraordinary scientist. And our collaborator, Nao Shida, Chia Weizhuang, David Ginti, Li Chun Luo, and Ishmael Abdusabo. And these are the funding agency, and then thank you very much. <laughs>